Scott for Scott's here. You ever want to grow new grass faster? Kind of like when you press the two times playback button on your podcast so you can speed through episodes. Except it's Scott's turf builder, rapid grass. You're speeding your way from a thin and damaged lawn to a thicker, stronger one in just weeks. Bit too fast, maybe slow it down, okay. Let's just go back to normal speed. Get a bag of Scott's Turf Builder Rapid Grass today. It grows grass two times faster than seed alone when applied at the new lawn rate subject to proper care. Feed your lawn. Feed it. Tackle your New Year's evolutions with vitamins and supplements from Ollie. Because this year, pressure-filled resolutions are out and evolutions are in. Sure, lofty goals are great, but little steps count too. One good night's sleep, one feel-good choice. Bite-sized goals lead to big wins. Ollie, supplements for your New Year's evolution. Find your new wellness go-tos at ollie.com. Ollie! These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 245, Operation Land Crab. Last time, as Kiska followed Atu in becoming a Japanese possession, the U.S. military evacuated the residents of nearby islands, as the enemy seemed to be coming ever eastward. Patrol Wing 4 and its leader, Captain Leslie Guerrez, kept up the bombing raids from Atka, 356 miles or 572 kilometers due east of Kiska, for three days, and in that time, 65,000 tons of bombs were dropped. But it seemed to make little difference. In fact, the natives of Atka were soon shipped off as well. No, the Japanese had won another round. On July 26, 1942, Charlie House, the lone survivor of Kiska, as far as he knew, slowly came out of the hills towards the Japanese camp. He was soon spotted, but as he was skeletal by this point, the enemy troops surrounded him, yet treated him with shock mixed with awe. They had assumed the island had killed him weeks ago. He was given biscuits and tea, but before he could allow himself to relax, a group of B-17s flew over, dropping their bombs. The men on the ground shot back at the planes, missing them, as much as the bombers had missed their targets. But Charlie was forgotten for a few minutes. The Japanese troops slowly led their captive back towards his original settlement, but when he laid eyes on it, it was his turn to be shocked. The three original huts were now surrounded by a small town that included a fire hydrant, a road, three power plants, a water storage tank, a telephone system, power poles, and defensive works. The nearby bay held a seaplane and a submarine base. Charlie would soon learn of the enemy's elaborate tunnel system, where the men hid when being bombed, that held a hospital and sleeping quarters. Just outside one of its entrances was a small garden and six Shinto shrines. Clearly, the enemy had been busy from the moment they arrived, and more importantly, it looked like they planned on staying for a while. Ironically, Charlie, after eating his fill, which he did not think was possible, was allowed to sleep in the same hut that had been his before the attack. The next day he learned that his nine-member team had been sent to Japan, arriving there eventually by July 2nd. But at least, they were still alive. Of course, what Charlie did not know was that these men were sent to the Ofuna interrogation camp just outside Yokohama. It was one of the worst camps, as the men who were sent there were considered by the Japanese to possess useful information. Hence, they were questioned and routinely beaten every two weeks. The Red Cross was not even told of its existence. The inmates called the place Torture Farm. Once some of Charlie's strength returned, his captives put him to work, filling sandbags for the defensive works. On September 20th, a cargo ship entered the harbor. Charlie was marched to the vessel and told to go down into the hold, where coal was stored. As he made his way down, a voice rang out, Hello. It was Chief Mike Hodakov. 
and his attuance. Yet Charlie's life wasn't the only one that was about to get worse. On September 14th, just days before Charlie departed, he had been busy filling up another sandbag when a buzzing noise could be heard in the distance. Looking up, he was shocked to see 14 P-39 Air Cobra fighter planes dive down towards the Japanese settlement, towards him. And once down, the Air Cobra stayed low and opened up with their machine guns. Kiska was being bombed again. The Kiska Blitz, though it had not started well in early July, as it did not deter the Japanese from staying, also did not deter the Americans from giving up, and by September their crews were not only reinforced, but had more planes at their disposal, in terms of quantity and quality. This was now how the enemy's position on Kiska would be attacked. First, the P-39 Era Cobra fighter planes came in, again low, to shoot up the Japanese anti-air defenses. This left the P-38 Lightning fighter planes to make for the enemy's Zero fighter seaplanes, called Rufis, bobbing up and down in the harbor. Then came 12 B-24 Liberators and a single B-17 Flying Fortress. Also coming in low, just 50 feet over the enemy's camp, the bombers not only shot up the place with their 50 calibers, but also dropped their payloads. For the last few days, each time after the latest bombing, the Japanese would, again, explain to Charlie that he was to go into the house that held the generator when the enemy came. But Charlie put his odds at surviving from hiding in such a place a zero, so he kept pretending to misunderstand, and instead ran for the underground tunnel. And on that day, September 14th, a bomb landed right on top of the hut he was supposed to be in. As the American air crews flew away that day, ten buildings were in flames. Two of their ships were sunk. Another three ships were on fire. Another three midget subs were wrecked. And some 400 soldiers were either dead or wounded. For their pains, the Americans lost two P-38 Lightning fighters as they when diving towards the same seaplane, ran right into each other, killing all on board. However, the Japanese lost every single plane they had that morning. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. Not that the Japanese could know this, but what set this air raid apart from the previous attacks was that these planes had taken off from a new secret air base located on Adak, just 240 miles or 386 kilometers away, which meant for the attackers, a round trip was just under three hours. Previously, the men had been taking off from just west of Dutch Harbor and had to fly 10 hours to make a bomb run on Kiska. Hence, the men, planes, and ordnance for the Kiska Blitz only increased, something the Japanese could not match. 
it seems that, at least here, Yamamoto's window of opportunity had finally closed. Four weeks after the attack on Kiska that almost saw Charlie killed by his comrade's bombs, the heaviest attack so far was made. On October 14, 1942, Kiska was visited by six B-26 Marauders, a twin-engine medium bomber, nine B-24 Liberators, a heavy bomber, 12 P-38 Lightnings, and that one B-17 Flying Fortress. Again, the fighters shot up the ground defenses, while the bombers dropped 500-pound bombs on the camp and the submarine base. This last part was based on the theory, let's kill the Japanese as fast as we can, but until then, if they have no ships or subs, they cannot threaten any other islands. The B-26 Marauders also had a torpedo underneath, so after the main attack was over, they went for a freighter in the harbor. For various reasons, all the torpedoes missed their target. As we have seen on a previous episode, the science of torpedo guidance left a lot to be desired. This was the one bright spot for the Japanese troops, who were probably tired of their lives on Kiska. Again, what made this shorter route possible was the new airstrip on Adak to the east of Kiska. And what made setting up that airbase possible was the all-clear signal given concerning Adak by Castor's cutthroats. During the night back on August 28th, two submarines dropped off 24 men on Adak. But these were not ordinary soldiers. For one, None of them wore a uniform or anything that indicated rank. Secondly, they all were able to thrive in the Aleutian climate. Their leader was Colonel Lawrence Kastner of the Alaska Combat Intelligence Platoon. Some of these men were Native Americans, Aleuts, and Eskimos, and each one of them knew how to live off the land to survive if anything went wrong. After covering dozens of miles, they ascertained that the island was free of enemy troops. This information was sent back to headquarters, and soon an airstrip was under construction. Now, this is where the planes would take off, in the continuing Kiska Blitz. Before this, it had been Fort Glenn on Umnak Island, 600 miles or 965 kilometers further to the east, that 10-hour round trip. Now, all this lent itself to one of the great ironies of the war. The Americans could not know, given the aggressiveness of the enemy, that the Japanese never intended to stay long-term in the Aleutians. In fact, by October of 1942, their forces on Attu, where the Joneses and Chief Hodakoff had become prisoners, had been evacuated and moved to Kiska. But even here, the plan was not to stay much longer. Instead, now that the troops had been consolidated, they were to be removed when the opportunity presented itself. But then, before this could happen, a Japanese reconnaissance plane flew over Adak and saw the new American airstrip. Further, other, though smaller groups of U.S. soldiers were seen on other islands, Clearly, the Americans were not only staying in the Aleutians, but building up their numbers. And that could only mean it was a matter of time before they began to push west, which is exactly what General Buckner planned on. But even worse, the Americans would eventually be in a position to attack Japan's home islands from the north. Again, exactly what Buckner planned for the future. All of this was sent back to Tokyo, and the result was that the Japanese Imperial Headquarters reversed its original decision. Their troops would have to stay in the Aleutians forever to check any American expansion. The troops on Kiska would remain and dig in for a defensive fight. Meanwhile, more troops would be sent to Attu, and an airfield would be built there. Before October was over, the new troops were on it too, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Hiroshi Yane Kawa. Yet the Americans did not find out the enemy had returned there until November 7th. 
when an airman flew over, expecting to see nothing. The Americans now knew that they were in for a long, bloody fight. Hence, the Americans needed another airfield, even closer to Kiska. And this was done on Amchitka Island, just 45 miles from Kiska. And it would be completed by January of 1943. So the Japanese were staying, but the Americans were coming. A reversal of fortune. As the bombing continued, the Japanese still showed no signs of leaving. Their lives had become sheer hell. But they had their orders, to hold the Western Aleutians at all costs. And since the bombing wasn't getting the job done, it was decided the next step would be, considering the lack of infantry, to throw up a naval blockade. To literally starve the enemy into leaving American soil. And against the odds, this blockade was successful. In fact, the Japanese forces on Attu and Kiska would receive their last shipment of supplies on March 10th of 1943. And yet, the Japanese demonstrated their resourcefulness by sticking it out on the two islands, though that meant fishing daily and digging for clams. With little to no progress being made, General Buckner realized the only way the enemy was going to leave was if American soldiers landed and pushed them off the islands. And reminiscent of the island-hopping campaign that would become the basic tenet of the Pacific campaign, Buckner decided to take a two first, though it was further west than Kiska. The days of just getting the Japanese to leave were over. By taking a two first, the enemy would be surrounded and annihilated, or forced to surrender. No, for the men of the Japanese Empire, it was decided that their participation in World War II was over. While the necessary preparations were underway for Operation Land Crab, the retaking of Kiska and Atu, it was vital that the Japanese did not become aware of the coming invasion. Hence, the bombings were kept up and joined by the Royal Canadian Air Force. As for the American or Allied punching power, the men who would actually be doing the fighting, a division from California was selected. That these men were not trained to deal with the Aleutian conditions seemed hardly important. The battle, it was determined, would only last three days. The men who would be doing the fighting were of Major General Albert Brown's 7th U.S. Infantry Division. Problem was, they had been training in California for desert warfare to help take on Rommel in North Africa. But by the time they were ready, they were no longer needed there. So the 7th got the nod. When they arrived in the forward area, before they would be placed aboard transports to make for a two, they showed up in short sleeves, and had the wrong kind of boots. Still, this would be over in a matter of days. As for the Canadians, their contribution to land crab would include about 5,300 men, mostly from the 13th Canadian Infantry Brigade of the 6th Canadian Infantry Division and the 1st Special Service Force, later known as Devil's Brigade. As opposed to the Americans, these men had been trained in winter warfare techniques. This episode is brought to you by Circle. What is Circle? First of all, it's a beautiful shape. It's consistent, inclusive, but it's also a place to build USDC, a digital dollar that's actually dollar-backed one-to-one. At Circle, they're building a future where money will travel at the speed of the internet for fractions of a penny. It's the place where crypto meets stability, where local businesses meet global customers, and the U.S. dollar meets USDC. Visit circle.com slash Spotify. The Allied plan was to break the 7th into four groups. Three would land at different places on Attu, while the 4th was held in reserve. As the village of Attu is on the northeastern corner of the island, on the western side of Chicago Harbor, two of the forces would land west of the Japanese position and some of their troops were south of the village, 
meet up and begin to push the outer limits of the enemy back north towards the harbor. Meanwhile, the third group would land south of the enemy and approach them from the other side, the southeast, to make sure the Japanese troops did not go into the mountainous area, where it would cost many Allied lives and time to get them out. No, it would be best to push all of them back north towards the harbor, where they could surrender, die, or be pushed into the ocean. By early May of 1943, everything was in place, except the weather. As the first week of May ended, it was as if the island decided to show the Americans what it was capable of. Hence, the invasion was postponed. But on May 11th, with everyone in place, men started landing at or close to their designated areas. As the Allied troops came ashore, they were shocked, but relieved not to be fired upon. They all assumed, as did their superiors, that the enemy had been caught unawares, which was not the case. The Japanese had their own crippies and picked up enough signals to know the Americans were coming to a two. So they planned accordingly. The Americans and the smaller number of Canadians came ashore. After reorganizing themselves, they moved out with their rations for one and a half days. The two formations to the west of the Japanese met up as planned and moved on to the east. Everything was going according to plan. Better, in fact. But what the Allies did not know was that the Japanese had already dug elaborate trenches and even tunnels along the base of the hills they were in. True, these were not mountains, those were to the east, but they were high enough to offer solid protection. The Japanese watched through the holes in the fog as the enemy got closer. Before the day was out, the Allied troops were within shooting range of the Japanese, who started firing at the oncoming enemy. And by the time the Americans dug trenches to set up return fire, the Japanese were gone into the fog, and though the Americans did not know this, into their tunnels. By midday of day two of Operation Landcrab, 44 American troops were dead with more wounded, and every time they pressed forward, the Japanese would fire volleys into their lines and then disappear. By day four, there were more dead, more wounded, no progress, and their rations had run out. The American soldiers, along with the Canadians, were now thinking of food, not of the enemy, in front of them. During these days, the fog and clouds remained thick enough so little air support was possible, or badly aimed. Indeed, attempts had been made, but the dropped supplies were blown away by the wind. Or, as in the case of Lieutenant Anthony Brennan and his B-24, he ended up flying into a mountain hidden by the mist. To be fair, the Japanese, knowing exactly where the enemy troops were, on relative flat land, perfect for bombing, were also unable to send planes from the Kuriles. Again, the fog. More days went by, but now it was the weather of a two that attacked the unprepared Americans. By now, Frostbite and Trenchfoot were winning the war for the Japanese, who wore more adequate clothing. The first of many amputations caused by infection were carried out among the Allies. Finally, after six days of being held back, the Allies made progress, though at a high cost. On May 16, 1943, Colonel Frank Cullen took his Company B of the 7th Infantry and climbed the nearest height, Davis Hill. They used the fog to their advantage by getting in close enough to the enemy to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which went on for hours. By 10.30 that night of May 16th, it was clear to the Japanese that the Americans were not going to leave this small foothold they had obtained, and with the Allies having 12,000 more troops behind Company B, the Japanese decided to pull back.
now the southern end of the valley that led to the Atu village, was in Allied hands. Not unexpectedly, the Americans tried to keep pushing the enemy back further north, and they were progressing. The overall plan was working, yet it was weeks behind schedule, and hundreds of American soldiers were now dead. Those ten days of fighting saw advancement, but death. Still, by May 26th, the Allies were at the point that if one more height could be taken, a rocky ridge called Fishhook, then it would be possible to use their superior numbers to push the Japanese into the waters of Chicago Harbor. It was the beginning of the end of the Japanese forces on a two. Yet, as they were desperate and fighting for the last height, they redoubled their efforts, to which the Americans were again held up, this time for two days. Company K of the 32nd Infantry had bloodied itself against the obstinate enemy line. Something had to give, or soon the Allies would have more dead and wounded than the Japanese had on the entire island, which was not something General Buckner wanted to explain to his superiors. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, as I just finished recording this, I got a message from someone. Um, I'm sorry, I can't. I didn't get your name, but I'll thank you properly on the next episode. When it comes to the illusions, I should have been saying "al iut" this entire time. So I've been saying it wrong, which is par for the course for me. But anyway, thank you, and again, I'll I'll thank you properly on the next episode. So the last thing I have for you is a short message from my pod partner, Cameron Riley. He's coming out with a new book, and uh, if you could just listen to this and help out if you are so inclined, he and I would greatly appreciate it. Um, and I will be back as soon as I can with the next episode. Take care, everyone. Hello, listeners of Ray's World War II podcast. My name is Cameron Riley. You may have heard of me. Ray and I, for many years now, have been doing a lot of podcasts together on the podcast network, uh, Caesar, Alexander, Cold War, Renaissance, Bullshit Filter, all that kind of stuff. But... I'm here today not to plug those podcasts, but it would be nice if you went and listened to them. Uh, They're fantastic. They're fabulous. They're terrific. They're tremendous. But I'm here to plug a book that I've written uh, called The Psychopath Economy. Didn't write it with Ray, uh, although I was thinking of Ray while I was writing it, as I think of Ray when I do most things. Written with my friend Tony Coniston, our friend Tony Coniston. Uh, It's basically about how psychopaths are running the world today. You know, the psychiatrists who study psychopathy say that about 1% of the world's population are high-ranking psychopaths. On the psychopath scale, they rank highly. And where are those 1% of people? My theory is that they are our CEOs, our politicians, our cardinals, our generals, our police chiefs. And there are, there are some good things that come out of having psychopaths in those positions, admittedly. But there's also a lot of bad things, and uh, I think we need to do a much better job of understanding the role of psychopathy and sociopathy, antisocial personality disorders, let's sum it up like that, and its role in our economy and what we do to protect ourselves. We want to we want to keep the good things that the psychopaths bring, like Steve Jobs inventing the iPhone, but protect ourselves from the bad things, global financial crises and pollution and destroying the environment and 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 uh, all those sorts of bad things. You know, raping children, priests and cardinals raping children and 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 covering it up and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, the book is currently up, available for pre-orders on a site called Publishizer.com. If you go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash psychopath economy, have the opportunity to pre-order the book and in doing so, help me get a publisher. Basically, it's like a it's like a crowdsourcing campaign for publishing. The more pre-orders the book gets, the more publishers take an interest in publishing it. Um, so if you want to, if, if it sounds like an interesting read, uh, go up to bit.ly slash psychopath economy bit.ly slash psychopath economy and uh, pre-order a copy of the book. I, I think you'll really enjoy it. Thanks. Struggling to pay your water or sewer bills? 
New Jersey's Low Income Household Water Assistance Program can help you avoid service disruptions, restore services, pay reconnection fees, and stay up to date on payments. Don't get shut off. Apply for the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program today. Call 211 or visit waterassistance.nj.gov. Call 211 or visit waterassistance.nj.gov.